welcome to the Fort Washington Manhattan League of Women Voters Candidates Night. Although we are based in Fort Washington and Manhasset, we represent most of the North Shore. We are pleased to host this debate and delighted to have Marion Fleming, right there, as our moderator. She comes from the Central Nassau League. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to voter education. There are membership and other materials on the table right to my left. And then Mary will tell you again to remind you, candidate biographies, one table over, and please help yourself to one from each. Please join the league. We do a lot of good work in the community. And have a great evening. Thank you, Mary. We will now begin with their three-minute opening statement. Ms. Israel, you may come to the podium. They will sit, however, when they answer their questions. Thank you very much. Have a big hand for the League of Women's Voters for sponsoring. Uh, thank you for all the work that uh, you do. Uh, before I begin, I think we should take a moment to acknowledge uh, a, uh, a tragedy occurred today. Uh, another Nassau County police officer was killed in the line of duty. Uh, this is the second Nassau County police officer killed in the line of duty in several days. And it reminds us uh, of the work that uh, our police officers do every day. Uh, and the risks that they take and sometimes the sacrifices that they make. Uh, and so I know our hearts and our, our thoughts and our prayers uh, go out to uh, the families and friends of the police officers that were lost. In, in my view, this election is really about one thing, and that is who has the best ideas to restore the middle class? How do you rebuild the middle class? Uh, the New York Times several years ago said that uh, I am a Democrat who has long tried to focus attention on the plight of the middle class. Newsday two years ago uh, said that I am a ferocious fighter for the issues that I trumpet. I choose these fights because I'm a product of the middle class. I grew up in Nassau County. I grew up in Levitt House in Levittown. My father was a traveling salesman. My mom started a typing business. Remember typing? A typing business. <laughs> in our home to make extra money. When I was in high school, we sat at the dinner table and I told my parents that uh, I thought I was smart enough to get into the four-year college that I wanted to get into. And they said, well, that's fine, but we just can't afford to send you to a four-year university. And so we made the decision that I would attend Nassau Community College for two years. And we would save our money and we'd go on to uh, get a four-year uh, education. That's why I'm fighting in Congress to pass the bill that I wrote to allow middle class families to set up education savings accounts using tax-free dollars. It is why I disagree with the Obama administration when they say that $250,000 makes you rich. $250,000 may make you rich in Louisiana, it does not make you rich on Long Island. Rich is relative. It's why I believe that we need to reduce our debt and have already voted for it, took the tough votes to cut $917 billion in spending. But I will not balance budgets on the backs of the middle class and our seniors, and I am a national leader in the fight against the Paul Ryan budget that ends Medicare in order to fund tax cuts for millionaires. And finally, it's why I have a record of achievement for the North Shore of Long Island. I authored and passed the Long Island Sound Stewardship Act unprecedented levels of federal assistance for the Long Island Sound to stabilize our property values, enhance our, our, our property taxes, enhance our property values, and protect our environment. On all of the issues that are important to the middle class, I have been a ferocious fighter and will continue to do so. Thank you very much. Mr. Talbot. Hello, 
I'm the Constitution Party nominee, Anthony Colba. I'm also the undefeated Republican primary candidate. The reason I describe it that way is because I have 1,077 signatures here. 938 were required to qualify. I took a month off from my job to walk through my hometown Bethpage and also my current town Huntington to get these signatures. 919 of them, uh, the rest were gathered by my supporters. That's an extremely high ratio for a candidate to obtain for their own, uh, for their signatures for themselves. According to New York State Supreme Court Justice Anthony Morano, my signatures were filed in a timely manner and were to be accepted by New York State Board of Elections. But the, uh, the Republican Party and the Board of Elections uh, were not happy with that decision and they were able to push through uh, a decision in the appellant court that threw me off of the ballot, not due to the merits of the case, but due to a technicality on what's considered proper legal service, which we were, my lawyer and I were able to find, had been met via case law history and, uh, and via their participation in the court proceedings and their, their legal representation. And Ron Paul was uh, also robbed of his primary ballot status the Republican National Convention. And I, I think really the heart of our problems as a country come from something that cannot constitutional be, constitutionally be legislated, but, uh, but that needs to be recognized and addressed otherwise. George Washington said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism, who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. Let it simply be asked, where is the security for prosperity, for reputation, for life? If the sense of religious obligation deserts the oaths which are instruments of investigation in the courts of justice, and let us with caution indulge supposition that morality may, can be maintained without religion, whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education, reason, and experience, both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. And that's all I have to say for now. Mr. McDermott. Good evening, everybody. Uh, before I start speaking, if you don't mind, I want to go over and shut off my ringer, which sounds like we're in the twilight zone. <laughs> I don't want anybody to think that's where we are. I got it. You got it. Thank you, Alan. My campaign manager already took care of it. Uh, my name is Michael McDermott. I want to thank uh, the League of Women Voters for hosting this. I think this is great. This is the way a, a debate should be done. We're all candidates that are on the ballot, um, that have worked hard to get on the ballot, uh, are, are able to express their views to the people of the district that they're representing. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate everybody else coming. I appreciate Congress and uh, Israel for coming here. Same with Anthony Tolga and Steve Levay. And, um, I just want to uh, open with, by saying that uh, I'm 59 years old, I have four children, uh, four girls, and uh, a grandson is sitting over there. And um, uh, I've been a Republican for 41 years. And like Mr. Tolga, I, I did go out and I did get uh, 1,177 signatures to become uh, a Republican in the primary. The difference between us, however, was that I decided not to put them in. And the reason I decided that is as I'm speaking to everybody and getting uh, all these signatures, which, as, as Mr. Tolga said, is very difficult um, to do, um, I mean, I, uh, I decided not to put it in. And the reason I decided not to put it in is because I realized that although I've been a Republican for 41 years, they've lost me. They've lost me because the work in Congress is not getting done. Republicans and Democrats just argue and snipe at each other, and the, the end result is that we, the American people, are suffering. So I had uh, somebody approach me to uh, vet for the Libertarian Party, and I said, Libertarian Party? I'm thinking, those nutty people, let me see what they're all about. <laughs> and then I read their platform, and their platform is basically supporting individual liberty, the way the Constitution had intended. 
that we can be free to do what we choose as long as we don't um, interfere with the liberties of other people. And it really grabbed me. And uh, I decided that I'm going to run and try to get a libertarian nomination. And I was successful in getting the nomination from these nutty people. Turn out they're not so nutty. And uh, it's the only party, I think, that makes sense. And I would urge you all to take a look at it, look at the platform, and see if it makes sense. So I'm running as a libertarian, and I'm proud to say that I have changed my Republican uh, not, uh, uh, party status to one of libertarian. It takes effect on November 7th. That's just the rule. And, um, and I'm very proud to be a libertarian. And I, and I hope that you all take a look at it and, and see that uh, whether or not you're a libertarian. Because I suspect that most of you are libertarians at heart. You just don't know it yet. So thank you very much. I feel like everybody recruited to their parties today. First, I, I do want to thank the League of Women Voters for uh, first of all hosting this event. In particular, uh, Judy and Jane, uh, I appreciate your patience. My schedule was the one was actually one of those that was so difficult to put together, and your flexibility. I, I'm so glad to be here, and I I appreciate your help. I really do. First of all, my name is Stephen LeBate, and I'm running for the United States Congress here in the uh, 3rd Congressional District. I'd like to tell you a little bit of something about myself. First off, I've spent the last 24 years serving my country in the United States Army and the Army Reserve. I've achieved the rank of uh, Lieutenant Colonel, and I've been called to duty three times since the terrorist attacks on 9-11. I'm running for Congress, frankly, because I have twin six-year-old children, and I'm scared for their future. I'm concerned about the future of millions of children across the country who right now are being straddled with incredible amounts of debt, millions and millions of dollars of debt because of the uncontrolled spending policies of my opponent as well as the current administration. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a change in leadership. Leadership. Because our children and our grandchildren, to be blunt, they deserve better. I've never held elected office before. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> what I am is I'm a soldier and I'm a dad. I do appreciate the league setting up this, uh, uh, this forum. Again, Jane and Judy, thank you very much. And I do look forward to taking your questions. that we have heard their opening statement, we are ready for the questions. I would like to ask the audience, please, during the questioning, hold your applause. At the end, when the closing statements are given, you may resume your applause. In addition, the questions will be answered in the order in which the gentlemen are seated. The first question will be answered first by Mr. Israel, and then the remainder. The second question will be answered first by Mr. Toll, and we will rotate in that fashion throughout the evening. The closing statements will also be given in reverse order, starting with Mr. LaFay first and then ending with Mr. Israel. Thank you so much for your attention. And now I see three questioners. Are there others who would like to come up to the microphone at this time? Question number one, questioner. Question about Social Security. I'm 85 years old. <coughs> it works. This is a question about Social Security. I'm 85. I have two children, two grandchildren. I would like for them to have the same benefits and same assistance that I've had in my life. So here's a question. 
Social Security is not going broke. It has billions of dollars coming in every day. But it needs more money. What do you think about raising the salary cap so that it, for now it ends at 105800 so it can go to all earned income and assure the viability of Social Security for my kids, my grandkids, and everybody else. Thank you. No. Yeah, there we go. Well, uh, well thank you very much for the for the question about Social Security. Look, entitlements are 60% of the federal budget. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and then interest on debt. 60% of the federal budget. 20% is defense, and 20% is everything else. All domestic discretionary spending. So that 60% is a big deal in determining our path to prosperity, middle class stability, and debt reduction. get Democrats and Republicans to sit down and consider a broad range of solutions to entitlements. Broad range. I'm, opening, I'm open to listening to anything. However, however, while I think we need to strengthen Social Security and Medicare, improve Social Security and Medicare, lengthen Social Security and Medicare, I will not negotiate the end of Social Security and Medicare, and that's exactly what the Ryan budget does on the Medicare side. I will not negotiate the end. To reduce debt, there's a lot of things we can do. My fundamental difference with uh, folks on the other side of the aisle and, and, and Mr. LeBay is that they want to balance the budget by starting first by saying to senior citizens, you lose your Medicare, but we fund tax cuts for millionaires. I think that's the wrong approach. Let's ask seniors to be the last to sacrifice because you've already made your sacrifices for your children and grandchildren. You ought to be the last to be asked to sacrifice. We ought to ask those like Bill Gates and Donald Trump and others who have the ability to do more to balance the budget to step up to the plate. And then we can engage in long-term reform strengthening of Medicare and Social Security. But do not end it to fund tax cuts to millionaires. <coughs> Last people that I would want to burden in our society, um, tied with the last people I'd want to burden with, would be our future, our children, but also our link to our past, our elderly. Um, the, the elderly population of America is our link to our Constitution. In their lifetime, the Constitution was not eroded so much as the Constitution. I, I've even seen be eroded just during my adult lifetime, which. Uh, a little bit shorter than probably most of the people in this room, um, but I'm, I'm noticing these problems. And to get to the question of Social Security, Erwin Schiff wrote in a book, his book, The Biggest Con, in, in the mid-70s, when the dollar had just gotten away from the gold standard, that Social Security, it's a Ponzi scheme. It's a bank, a, just another bankrupt government institution. And I don't want to take it away from anybody, but we, we need to realize that this is a pyramid scheme. It cannot work indefinitely. It would not be right to take it away from people that already have it, but the following generations that are going to lose it just due to the, our currency's incapacity to keep up, they deserve to be able to opt out. And that, that's what I would like to do with Social Security. Allow the youth to be able to opt out, but not to end it for anybody that's paid into it significantly throughout their whole life. So make <laughs> You want me to pass this one around if you want to put that one back. I hate taking your microphone away from the public. <laughs> um, as far as Social Security, uh, 
Congressman Israel said that uh, he'd like to sit down with Democrats and Republicans, you know, all sitting down and talking to each other. If that were able to happen, or had that been happening, I wouldn't be running for office. The fact is, they don't talk to each other, and I wish they would talk to each other. And uh, Social Security, uh, I remember last year when President Obama said, if we don't pass a continuing resolution, Social Security checks may not go out. And, and the reason that is happening is because Social Security money, uh, President Johnson uh, took the money from Social Security and put it into the general fund. So we have a really big problem because Social Security does not have money. They're waiting each month for checks to come in from the younger people that are paying, people that are not on Social Security. And the fact is, those people, most of the people in this audience, the way things are going, are not going to collect Social Security. You're paying into it. You're not going to get the benefit of it. Something has to change. Certainly, uh, the gentleman that's 85 years old, your Social Security is secured. And I think uh, mine is at 59, probably. There are a lot of wealthy people that are uh, collecting Social Security. So changes have to be made. But I, I agree with, uh, with both these gentlemen that we, Social Security is something that people are living on. I have a friend in Fort Lauderdale that gets $639 a month after the IRS takes out $120 for some past sin. And that's what he's living on. And he can't live on it. So we, we have to make some changes to sustain it and to really make it sustainable. And uh, the, the money that, that has been taken away by President Johnson should be back into the system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first off, I think that's a very common sense, one of the solutions to look at, why we uh, know it's increasing the salary caps. It makes total sense. But my question to uh, Congressman Israel, you've been in office for 12 years, why have you not put forth an actual bill to initiate that procedure, number one? Uh, number two, I don't recall ever stating to anybody, and it sure is not any kind of campaign literature, that I support destroying Social Security or Medicare or seeing it dissolved. It's an outrageous comment, and that's something which is completely false. Now, in fact, sometimes I think, honestly, he thinks my name is Paul Ryan instead of Stephen LeBate. But the key point here is we actually do need a bipartisan solution. This name calling has got to stop. This, this situation, we have to work together. Look, if the, we're in the uniform of our country for 24 years. The one thing that I learned is the fact that you have to be able to work together as a team. You can't be, it, I, Michael put it very well. He said, you know what? Both parties are not talking to each other. They're not talking to each other because we're making accusations that instead of working together as a group and a team for the common good of the country. I think that's what we've lost touch with. We've lost touch with the fact that you go into elected office because you're there not for yourself. You're not there to enrich yourself or enrich your person or whatever the case may be. You're there to serve. You're there to serve the people of this country. So that's really what I had to say in that regard. We do need these kinds of bipartisan solutions. But again, I address Congress in Israel if that is such a great idea. Why didn't you initiate it in the first place? The second question, and it will be answered first by Ms. Cohen. Uh, good evening. My name is Howard Herman. I'm from Great Neck. I have a question relating to, to one aspect of the, uh, the partisan gridlock that we have in, in, in Congress and in Washington. Um, many people would blame it, at least in part, on the Grover Northwest pledge that many Republican members of Congress have taken. And I wonder whether any of you uh, can, can answer whether it's ever appropriate for a legislator to take a pledge in advance of taking office that he or she will or won't vote against a certain type of measure while serving, while serving their constituents. Is a pledge ever appropriate? I'm of the opinion that pledges are most certainly appropriate so long as candidates aren't pledging to vote for bills that they haven't read or haven't yet been proposed. Oftentimes you'll hear a premise, well, would you support a, a bill and they give you the title of the bill? So the, the Patriot Act was presumably, by its title, very patriotic, but when you look at the implications it's had on our Constitution, uh, it's been anything but patriotic if you really scratch the surface on the ramifications of that bill. And uh, it seems to be an epidemic in Congress. Is it, you know, okay? We hear a lot about the gridlock, but we don't. What we don't hear enough about is, is the horrors that come through Congress when they work together. So I, I don't want to see uh, 
uh, Congress where they're working together. Because well, quite frankly, they are they are massively incompetent of getting it right. That's why their approval rate rating is in single digits right now. I am absolutely opposed to candidates making pledges. I will not make any pledges except that of the oath of office and the pledge to uphold the Constitution of the United States. Once you make a pledge to raise taxes, not raise taxes, to do what, you're, what you were saying, you box yourself in to tell, let people know, to make a pledge so people will vote for you or because you think you do it is a big mistake of, that candidates make. Because once you make a pledge, you're boxed into that. Now, I don't know if I'm going to raise taxes or not raise taxes or vote for it. Because once you get on the inside and you start learning what's really going on, maybe my opinion would change, but I can't do it because I get a pledge not to do it. So I think making pledges is foolishness on the part of a candidate. You know, you make a pledge of the oath of office and to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And every decision you make in Congress should be based on the information that you're able to gather through the CBO and other avenues that we don't have available to us so readily as, as uh, the electorate. So I'm opposed, I'm opposed to making pledges. Uh, well, first off, I know Congressman Israel is dying to answer this question because actually I did sign that pledge, and I'm very happy that I did. The American people right now are taxed too much. We do not have a tax problem right now in this country. What we have is a spending problem. We've spent, five, we've added $5 trillion, $5 trillion in debt in just the past four years. That's an egregious amount of money. We're taking too much money from the... By me taking that pledge, that is a promise to the American people that I'm not just going to do what is typical in Washington, Washington, which is spend, spend, spend. American people are not looking for that. What the American people are looking for right now is they're looking for a disciplined leadership. When they, when they give their word, they keep their word. Now, that pledge in particular, especially in this kind of environment, it makes total sense. Why am I going to take money away from the American people and small business owners when they're barely making ends meet right now? That pledge in itself does not mean 10 years from now if, if there's a conflict or some sort of a crisis that we wouldn't raise taxes. But in that pledge, I meant it because we have a spending problem. The American people, five, for example, let's look at the stimulus bill. $700 billion was spent in stimulus. About four or five hundred million dollars went to our old congressional district, Congressional District 2. It's supposed to stimulate jobs, right? In CD2, it created a total of 181 jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, when you have results of spending like that, everybody here at this table should take a pledge that they're not going to take any more money from American people until the government learns how to spend it properly. Well, uh, I'm glad that Mr. LeBate has, uh, has said that he signed the Grover Norquist Pledge. He signed another pledge that he didn't tell you about. It was uh, a pledge called the Contract from America, several years ago, where he pledged to support one flat tax, which by its nature would eliminate all of the middle class tax deductions that this community needs. Mortgage interest, property tax deduction, child tax credit, because he signed the pledge. Now let me give you an alternative to signing pledges. It's real solutions. And let me give you one example. We've got an unsustainable debt in this country. There are different ways that you can reduce your debt. You can reduce spending, and I, I didn't pledge. I took the tough vote to cut spending $917 billion, including things that that I didn't want to cut, but I understood there's got to be bipartisan compromise. We had a compromise all ready to go. Four trillion dollar, big, bold, balanced debt reduction. It was rejected by the Tea Party Republicans in Congress. Mr. LeBate calls himself an extension of the Tea Party. Now his words, not mine. Why? Because the three trillion dollars in spending cuts asked for one trillion dollars in tax increases on millionaires. And the Tea Party Republicans in Congress rejected $3 trillion in spending cuts because of $1 trillion in tax increases for Donald Trump. When they say that they won't support a nickel of tax increases on the rich, under any circumstances, no way, no how, that's straitjacket economics. Question number three. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates for, for coming here and spending your time to educate us about your views. Um, those of us in the 5th Congressional District, the old 5th Congressional District, which is now a large part of the new uh, district that, that we're here tonight, for um, worked very hard to get Congressman Ackerman to finally disassociate himself from the anti-Israel group J Street. Um, and Congressman uh, uh, Ackerman did that in uh, January of 2011 uh, when J Street uh, uh, asked Obama to support a, um, an anti-Israel resolution in the UN. Uh, Congressman, this is partly, uh, mostly directed towards Congressman Israel. Congressman Israel, you were involved with uh, the J Street Host Committee in 2009. Will you tonight follow uh, Congressman Ackerman's suit and uh, declare yourself uh, disassociated from J Street? And will you commit, uh, to, uh, you're the head of the DCC, will you commit tonight to not providing uh, DCC funds to J Street candidates and Gaza 54 candidates, Gaza 54, the Democratic, 54 Democratic candidates, a Democratic congressman uh, who signed a, a, a horrible anti-Israel banner. That, that's my, you know, I, I've already stated two questions as part of it. No, no, I have no station with J Street. Uh, I've heard of K Street. That's where the lobbyists are. <laughs> Mr. Israel, you may know where K Street is. And uh, K Street is where the lobbyists, uh, I think there are 245 lobbyists for every member of Congress. So imagine that. But no, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not associated with J Street. I let Congressman Israel um, mention that. Uh, um, first off, um, prior to going to that question, I just want to say that I have no idea what Congressman Israel is talking about. Signing some sort of pledge years ago, perhaps that when I wasn't even engaged in politics. I, I have no clue. Where you, I do not support taking away. I enjoy those tax deductions on my home. Why would I take away tax deductions that, frankly, with my twin six-year-olds, you know, that's how I get tax refunds. So it's completely, utterly ridiculous, and I have no idea what that's about. I, in regards to this other accusation, quite frankly, you know what? If you want to accuse me of, for example, believing our government should balance its budget and not spend more money than it brings in, you know what? Well, you got me. You got me. Right? I'm guilty as charged. However, I think that's what the members of Congress should be doing right now, because if they did have those kinds of principles and beliefs, then you know something? We may not be $16 trillion in debt. Our credit rating wouldn't have been cut for the first time in our history, and I might add, that was on your watch, sir. Now, in regards to the question, no, I have no, uh, I'm not associated with J Street, and in regards to the Muslim Brotherhood, I think what's deeply unfortunate, the circumstances and the lack of engagement that our, the current administration had during that uprising, and as a result of that, I'm, my concern is that, you know, we went out of the frying pan into the fire, because right now they're an unknown quantity. So, uh, my, I'm hoping for the best, but I do have deep concerns. Thank you, Liz. Um, you, you know my record. Uh, and don't take my word for it. Israel's ambassador to the United States came to this community several years ago and said, Israel has no stronger friend in the United States Congress than Congressman Israel. To the consternation of some of you and to the contentment of others, I lean to the right on foreign policy, on national security, on military issues. I lean to the left on investing in education, protecting our environment, protecting Medicare and Social Security, on foreign policy issues, national security Israel, and to the right of most people in my party. I'm the only member of Congress who called for the arrest of Ahmadinejad when he came to New York on charges of inciting genocide. I was pleased to hear Mitt Romney repeat my call last night at the debate. Uh, I was the one who passed an amendment in Congress that says that no federal agency can have any relationship with any company anywhere in the world that could be in violation of the Iran Sanctions Act. I was a member of Congress who helped push through a $250 million increase in foreign military financing for the state of Israel. And uh, so I'm very proud of my record uh, on Israel, and I don't take second seat to anyone. I've had some disagreements with J Street. In fact, I fundamentally disagree with J Street. But you know what? I also, I guess, I'm a libertarian on some issues. If somebody wants to come to Washington to express a view, even one with which I disagree, I think they have the right to express it. I'm all for democracy. I think this 
is actually a very important question because it touches on one of the greatest dangers that we're dealing with in this Obama administration, of which Congressman Israel has called himself Obama's partner in Congress. So I, I don't quite know how you get to the right of your own party uh, voting close to 100% of the time with your party during the most dangerous left-wing administration America has ever seen and hopefully will ever know. Um, in regards to funding the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, I would object to any and all funding of the Muslim Brotherhood as well as any and all other foreign aid. We cannot sustain bribing and, and, and giving handouts and bailouts to the whole world, to Wall Street. We are going to collapse the currency on this course. Now, Obama took this incident on September 11th of this year in the Middle East and turned it into an attack against our freedom of speech and blamed the movie called The Innocence of Muslims uh, on YouTube. And there were, there were riots all over the Middle East as a result of Obama fueling the fire with his rhetoric. The UN was also mentioned and there's been a lot of Islamic pressure in the UN to end freedom of speech as we know it with their uh, blasphemy laws that they want to push through. And uh, should we be unfortunate enough to have to endure another Obama administration and another Steve Israel administration, I have great concerns for the survival of our freedom of speech. If you look at what's going on in colleges all across America now, they have free speech zones. All of America is a free speech zone. Question number four, Mr. LeMay, you answer first. I'm very concerned about health care, and uh, I was happy that we finally got some changes in health care so that we now have coverage as of uh, 2014 for pre-existing conditions, and uh, we have preventive care coverage, and we have help with drug costs. and. I know there are, many, there are people who want to uh, repeal uh, this act and I find it a great concern and I, I want to ask what are they going to put in its place to help with health care? Um, first and foremost, we have the best health care system in the world. People from all over the globe, just a second, people from all over the globe come to the United States for their health care. Does that mean that it's perfect? Absolutely not. Does it need reform? Yes, it does, without question. However, what we have is not a medical problem, it's a cost problem. Now, in regards to Obamacare, I do not support Obamacare. All right, I feel it needs to be repealed. And the reason for that, the negatives far outweigh the positive, whatever positives there are in regards to Obamacare. First and foremost, in order to pay for Obamacare, all right, they had to cut, the federal government, including supported by my opponent, Congressman Israel, cutting $716 billion of Medicare. Congressman Israel voted to cut $716 billion from Medicare to help pay for Obamacare. Now, he's going to only say, well, it was only for subsidies, for doctors. Well, I'll answer that right off the bat. Did anybody speak to these doctors? Number two, it involves 21 new taxes at a time where we should not be taking money away from people. People are struggling now to make ends meet. So we're going to have 21 new taxes to pay for a program that two-thirds of the American public don't want in the first place. And number three, there is that intrusion between that very important and sacred doctor-patient relationship that, quite frankly, the government has no place. To address your question, number one, what we need to do is we need to look at free market principles where we allow insurance companies to sell insurance over state lines. There's only eight companies, I'm sorry, only eight companies in the country right now, in the state that can sell insurance. If we allow sale over insurance over state lines, 20, 30, 40 companies, and you know what? The cost will come down. We look at tort reform, and, and when you look at tort reform and malpractice, all right, then that will bring down the cost of insurance. And that's a critical piece right there, because tort reform wasn't even entertained during the original quote-unquote negotiations for Obamacare. I'm sorry, I went over. You know, most of what I learn and know as a member of Congress, I learn and know by listening to the people that I represent. 
And I will never forget talking to women that I had the honor of representing who came to my office with notifications from their insurance company telling them that they were being dropped from their insurance because they had breast cancer. And their insurance company had decided that breast cancer was a pre-existing condition. The free market didn't work for those women. I will never forget talking to men who came to my office with the same termination notices saying that their insurance company was no longer, would no longer cover them because they had reached their lifetime cap. They said, Congressman, I didn't know there was a lifetime cap. And now I've reached it. And my condition isn't covered by my insurance company. Mr. LeBay has said on his first day in Congress, he will repeal the Affordable Care Act. On his first day in Congress, he will tell that woman, you're no longer covered by insurance if you have breast cancer. He will tell middle class parents, your kids can no longer stay on your insurance policy until they're 26. He will tell seniors, the donut hole is now no longer being closed, it's being opened again, costing you three to six million dollars around the country. He will tell consumers that their insurance companies will make their decisions for them rather than their doctors. This is a fundamental disagreement that we have. The Affordable Care Act provided for essential consumer protections. I'm not going to repeal it on the first day. I'm going to make sure people have those protections. Mr. Talbot? It wasn't the free market that failed women in regards to our health care system. It was our government that failed the free market. See, the problem, one of the core problems with our health care system is the lobbyists from Big Pharma working hand, to hand, hand in hand with our so-called representatives, which are behaving more and more like bureaucrats as time goes on. And, and this is the core of our problems, not the free market failure. Now, I agree that purchasing health care across state lines is a partial solution. I agree that tour reform is a par partial solution. But until we fix the, the problem of lobbyists and, and all this super PAC money and big pharma controlling elections, when, when you have a candidate with millions of dollars and, and uh, a lot of it's coming from sources that, that have a lot of money and, and have some pretty loud opinions, uh, it, we have a problem here between big government and big business. This is not capitalism, it's crony capitalism, and both sides of the aisle are involved in it, and you won't have any of that coming from a, a total administration in Congress, that's for sure. It's a great question with no easy answer. Uh, Anthony Toldo is correct. Uh, I agree with what he was saying about Big Farm and the rest. Um, you know, when, when, when uh, Obamacare was being voted on and Nancy Pelosi said you have to pass it before you read it, I thought, you know, reading it is probably a good idea. So I contacted uh, Congressman Israel's office and uh, two or three months of requesting it and getting formed with us about other things, his office was kind enough to send it to me. And, uh, and I do appreciate that, Congressman. And uh, forget about reading it, it's impossible. It's 2,700 pages of who knows what it really says. Uh, you only hear what the media tells you. And what the media is telling you is um, the, the individual mandate, you have to, you, you have, now you have to pay tax. I mean, it's all kind of confusing and they direct you in the wrong thing. The question about health care is a serious thing. Making a, a pledge to repeal it or not repeal it is not the right thing to do in my opinion. Um, crossing straight lines and, and making it more affordable for health insurance companies, I absolutely agree with. Um, but I saw a movie, thanks to an organization called Save Long Island, that I, I really think everybody should look at. I saw a movie on GMOs, genetically modified foods, and I'm telling you, we have bigger problems than the repeal of health care. You know, they are, they are now genetically splicing BT pesticides into corn, cow corn, as, as one example, that puts into the corn the DNA, so if, a, if bugs land on it and they eat it, their stomachs burst. Now that food, that corn is going to our cows, chickens, and, and some fish, and you know what's happening? Their bellies are bursting open, and when you eat that food, the, the cows or the, or the chicken, that pesticide is inside of you. So there are major problems with the, with the health care system, and that, that definitely has to be changed. Question number five. And uh, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, this will be the last question of this debate.
Please answer yes or no, or if you want to abstain, you can understand that. No speech. Uh, yes or no to this question. Are you in favor of a proposal to raise the income tax on short-term capital land? gains that's less than one year. To something like 25 or 35 percent and lower the tax rate on long-term capital gains, which is over a year, might be 20 years, 30 years, to something like 5 or 10 percent. Yes, no, or abstain. Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna frustrate you because sometimes there's not a yes or no answer to a question. I need to understand the fiscal impact. The problem with Washington is that two plus two equals whatever people want it to be. And so my answer to your question, forgive me, I can't just say yes or no. I've got to say I want to make sure that number one, it's paid for, that we're not going deeper into debt in order to in order to, to do that. Number two, I want to make sure it's fair to the middle class on Long Island. And if it's paid for and it's fair, then I would support it. But I can't, it's like signing a pledge. I can't make that commitment until I understand the, the consequences and the impacts on the people and the families that I represent. Thank you again, and, and uh, I, I appreciate Steve uh, acknowledging that uh, he, he has some scheduling issues, and, and so that kind of uh, together, uh, we both have some scheduling issues, and uh, that's caused a little bit of a, of a rush tonight. I apologize for having to leave early. I'm honored to have this debate with, uh, with my colleagues. I may not agree with them, but uh, I think it says something about our democracy when you can have people with such varied opinions come together and, and talk about what they believe and what they're fighting for. You did hear some contrast tonight. Uh, Mr. LeBate called the Ryan budget, uh, which ends Medicare to fund tax cuts for millionaires. In his words, an amazing start and definitely the right course. I disagree. I think you don't start by cutting Medicare for seniors. You start by asking millionaires to pay a little more. Uh, he did sign a tax pledge that said he would never, ever, under any circumstances, raise taxes on anybody, no matter how much money they make. I think that's the wrong prescription for the middle class. On the issue of choice, on the issue uh, of, uh, of abortion, he said that he has right to life and he will never compromise on that issue, ever. I respect his opinion, I just disagree with it. Uh, he said that same-sex marriage is the greatest single threat to Judeo-Christian values in the world. I disagree with that. That's ideology, I think we need to focus on solutions. My solutions include passing the Long Island Sound Stewardship Act in a Republican administration signed by President Bush on a bipartisan basis. I led the fight to pass that because it was good for the middle class, good for our property values, good for our tax base, and good for our environment. I've solved problems by securing nearly $6 million in back pay for the veterans that I represent. And I will continue to fight battles for the middle class and not balance budgets on the middle class and our seniors. When Newsday called me a ferocious fighter for the issues that I trumpet, I think they were right. And the issues that I trumpet are a prosperous middle class, our children, our seniors, and our veterans. Thank you very much for considering my views, and thank you for welcoming me to the community.
Well, I'll give you the short answer first, but you might wish that I've abstained also. No. Um, the reason being, should we, should we raise short-term capital gains tax, you are potentially creating a situation where a lot of investors would pull out of the market. The markets are unstable in the first place, and I don't think that raising short-term capital gains would help. But what we really should be discussing here are the bailouts, which Steve Israel has been a part of, and which the Republican Party has also been a part of. And uh, it's most unfortunate that the American people got stuck with the bailouts when well over 90% of the American people were uh, staunchly against the bailouts. And I pointed out in the 2010 debate with News 12 that, uh, that New Zealand did not do any bailouts, although their bankers cried bloody murder the same way that our bankers did, and their economy has been doing very well, where our economy is, uh, is doing a slow, or sometimes not so slow version of the Olympic downhill. Now, what I think, or what I would like to see happen in America, is what Iceland did, how they handled their bankers. They did not, they did not deal with the bailouts. The, the people did not have that debt on their head. They told their bankers, you belong in jail, and the bankers that belonged in jail went to jail, and they tossed out their incumbent uh, criminal uh, organization that was running their government, and I'm of the opinion that, that those are the solutions that America needs. Mr. LeBay, sure. he has to leave also, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. 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 Answering his question first. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going I'm to do that right now. Uh, and honestly, I think Congressman Israel gave an appropriate answer that you have to examine what the pluses and minuses are. All right, you have to, for example, if you're talking about General Electric paying no taxes at all, uh, obviously there's a problem, all right, and that needs to be addressed. Uh, but I, I would abstain on that for the same reasons as Congressman Andrew, because I, you need to really look at what the ups and downs are, what are the, uh, what are the pluses and the minuses. It's not as simple as it may seem. But um, first off, just to address Congressman Israel's closing, and I have to close, but I, I have to be somewhere in like 10 minutes ago. Um, First off, if you continually repeat things, and in reference to Congressman Israel, if you repeat things over again, over and over and over again, that just ain't so, that doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it true. When Congressman Israel takes uh, comments from me, taken totally out of context, that may have been years ago, in reference to whatever issues they are, that doesn't mean that it sounds as it seems. You take one sentence, out of a uh, out of a perhaps a 30-minute presentation, and then you know what? Hey, it's a gotcha moment, ladies and gentlemen. That's the reason why our country and our elected officials right now, why so many of them, quite frankly, need to go. We're not working together in a bipartisan manner. We're not working together in a manner that you know makes our founding fathers proud. Throwing rocks and throwing stones—that's absolutely kind of foolish. And as I said, repeating a falsehood over and over again. That doesn't mean it's going to make it true. Uh, I'm going to do my closing. On November 6th, uh, the voters in the 3rd Congressional District, frankly, will have the opportunity to choose between two very different approaches for our country. We can continue the big government tax and spend ways of my opponent, which frankly have led this country to over $16 trillion in debt, 23 million unemployed, and 50 million Americans on food stamps. Or we can change direction, rein in that government spending. I mean, it is allowed. We can stop spending. Right? We are in debt and implement what are actually true pro-growth and pro-jobs policies. It's time that we end these policies, which frankly are putting our country on the verge of fiscal insolvency and financial ruin. We need to get the federal government out of the way, our small business owners, so they can do what they've always done best which is create jobs, wealth, and prosperity for all Americans. These common sense solutions, we need to, common sense solutions, bipartisan solutions, and frankly, we finally, we need to get this job done. I ask you to send me to Congress. I ask you to send me to Congress so I can be part of the solution, not part of the problem. I want to thank you again this evening, uh, the League of Women Voters, I appreciate your time, and I ask you for your support on November 6th. Thank you.
answer this gentleman's question. He's been so patient. <laughs> Of the chair, I've been here for a while now. Before I guess no or abstain question, it's not on one. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to frustrate you too because uh, I can't say yes, no, or abstain. What I can tell you is that I am in favor of repealing the 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment is the amendment that uh, allowed the government uh, the income tax, to collect income tax from people. I don't think the federal government has a right to get into everybody's face to find out what they make, how they make it, and how much of a part that they should get. So I'm in favor of abolishing the income tax. Now, of course, how do you pay for everything? Well, first you have to reduce the federal government to its constitutional sum. It's so huge, there's no way that we can reduce this deficit. It's, we've got 16 trillion dollars in debt. We've got 900 military bases in 136 countries. So how do you pay for things? Well, I believe we could do it with a consumption tax. A consumption tax is about 3% of GDP, which is gross domestic product will be enough to pay for a constitutional size of government and take care of all the things that we have. Because I think the federal government is too intrusive. And the Democrat and Republicans will always want to, to find out what you do in every phase of your life. We've got problems with 47% of the American public not paying taxes. And I don't think that the government has a right to get into all of your faces. So I'm opposed to the income tax in any way, shape, or form. Okay. We now come to the final closing statements. I don't see other questions. Oh, now, uh, Mr. Mc, Mr. McDermott, don't sit. Come to the podium. It's your time for your two minutes in the light. <laughs> I don't think we need stereo, so. <laughs> two minutes in the light. Let's see. Yes. You know, I've been listening. Uh, I, I love to be here with uh, Congressman Israel and Steve Levay. Uh I'm not opposed to that. I, don't, I think they're fine gentlemen. I think uh, Steve Israel really wants to do the right thing. Um, a lot of things about his, his uh, part in Congress that I disagree with. One is that he's there for 14 years, and he's part of the problem of why things don't get done. It's okay to be partisan. It's not okay to be hyper-partisan, but you don't talk to each other. I mean, even Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, really like each other. They had lunch every Thursday and talked about things. Not this Congress. Representative Peter King endorsed Steve LeBay and doesn't have a whole lot of nice things to say, but he's very supportive of Steve LeBay. And if Steve Israel wins this election, Steve Israel is going to go back to Congress with Peter King and expect him to talk to him. Well, that's not going to happen because congressmen from a neighboring district should stay out of the, 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 uh, the election of, of, of the I hear Obama and Romney, you know, we've got to work on the top down, the bottom up, the middle out. I'm thinking, what the hell are they talking about? I mean, the fact is, we have a lot of things to do. And whether it's top down, middle up, taxing the rich, not taxing the rich, this is all just talking points to get you diverted from the real issue. And the real issue is that the federal government is too large. We're not taking care of the things that are really important. The president or, or, uh, of, of the FDA, uh, of Monsanto, which is that big pharma that, that Anthony was talking about, was transferred over to, to run the FDA, who's in charge of, it's like the fox in charge of the chicken coop. It's really, uh, really awful. And uh, let's see, I, in closing, a lot of people have said that a vote for a libertarian or constitution party candidate is a wasted vote. Because if you vote for us, one of the Republicans or Democrats might get into office. But I'd like to ask you all to, you know what happens when you waste your vote on me? I win. If you all waste your vote on me, I win. And we need to have independent thinking in our Congress. If we don't, we're going to follow the same path we've been on. And it's a losing path, ladies and gentlemen. But I do appreciate your, your time and your effort and your uh, allowing me to speak. Thank, Thank you very much. good that we agree that Big Pharma is a problem. I would like to note, however, an example of Big Pharma would be a company such as Pfizer, whereas Monsanto is an example of Big Agriculture. So it's the Big Agriculture Monsanto that is a problem with our food supply, which does lead to health care problems, but addressing the health care system, Big Pharma, a better example would be Pfizer. Now, the endorsement I'm proudest of in this election is the endorsement of 
the president of the New York State chapter leader of Oath Keepers. Now, they as an organization do not endorse, but this individual that holds the New York State presidency does endorse me. And uh, They're an organization that reaches out to our military, current and veterans, and our police officers, current and veterans, and firms their minds up in regards to following the Constitution because they have had a lot of unconstitutional orders, um, very much so uh, increasingly over the past 11 years. And uh, it's not looking like it's going to stop anytime soon. So what I feel that the Oath Keepers does is so important is uh, they're, they're exposing, uh, the, our, basically our last line of defense, our, our own people that are, are trained to protect us and to serve us, to recognize um, the psychopathy that comes out of our government. And if anybody does any significant research on psychopathy, uh, on the history of psychopathy in governments and, and the effects on the people, and, and unfortunately a lot of the people being bamboozled, um, you can see that, that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from history that our current Congress is not representing. And I don't feel that any reaching across the aisle with this current crop is, is going to help that. And, and I do not look to work across the aisle. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that William Shakespeare's character, Mercutio, in, in Romeo and Juliet probably said it best when he said a plague on both your houses, because the plague is what they're bringing on our people. And until we can break away from that, we're not going to make any progress. Uh, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this debate, and thank you, Mr. Steak, for joining me this evening. My voters, as you will soon find out, will have a real choice to make this November, and I believe my record distinguishes me. And I just want to point out, sadly, that tonight, today, we mourn another law enforcement officer killed in the line of duty. Gun violence, make no mistake about it, whatever you hear is way up, and our law enforcement officers are being killed at an all-time high rate. I am the most outspoken state legislator in giving law enforcement the tools they need to track illegal guns and put criminals behind bars. And I'm very proud of the high number, in fact, just about all law enforcement agencies that can, in this district, gave me their endorsement. I am a very proud supporter of a woman's right to choose, and I'm proud to be named a champion by Planned Parenthood on my record for women's rights. I have voted for an unprecedented cuts to two state budgets, totally $13 billion in state spending, while hard to believe not raising taxes or fees. I have sponsored the biggest tax reform act in 58 years, giving tax cuts to 99% of New Yorkers, while increasing funding to schools, healthcare institutions, and investing in state infrastructure, repairing our roads, bridges, and parks. I've secured tax credits to spur the creation of private sector jobs and created a permanent low-cost energy program for the small businesses that are definitely impacting on Long Island. And everyone here knows about my opposition to hydrofracking in its present form and my strong record to protect the environment. I've worked with Governor, close, uh, Governor Cuomo closely to put New York back on track, and no one can deny, not even my opponent, that I work across the aisle to get results. I have a strong record of accomplishment on mandate relief, pension reform, tax cuts for the middle class, and bringing resources to all education institutions. I ask for your vote this November 6th to be re-elected to the New York State Assembly. Let's keep New York on the right track. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rick Steek. I am the Republican and Conservative Party candidate for the New York State Assembly in our district. I want to thank the League of Women Voters. I want to thank Michelle. Uh, for coming to this event. Um, I've had the great opportunity over the last few weeks to meet with the seniors over at the Amsterdam House in uh, Port Washington and the nurses at Malloy College and to hear what, what matters to a lot of people. Uh, look, I grew up in South Texas as a poor farm, poor ranch boy where everything mattered when you worked for yourself, you learned how to get by and you struggled. Thanks to my mom's dedication as a small business owner 
I was, had, I was given the opportunities to focus on school and learning how to be a leader amongst my, my peers. I went to West Point where I graduated with about a thousand other very honorable people, many of whom right now are in Afghanistan and Iraq, and don't let the media fool you, we're still in Iraq. Um, I came here about five years ago when I married my lovely bride, Nancy, who's been a Port Washington resident since about 1996. Um, my focus is on small businesses. Now, Ms. Ms. Schimmel here says that she's cut taxes for everybody without raising a single tax, but unfortunately the MTA tax that she voted in favor of was one of several, including my property tax increases, that drove me to run. I'm a, I have very simple goals and very simple objectives, which is to get the, the spending in our state out, get it under control, and quit worrying about paying the outlandish bills, but get the bills themselves actually under control. I also want to take care of the small business owners and give them an opportunity to succeed and expand and grow by hiring new people and getting a tax base, an income tax based incentive to actually grow their business and succeed. I walk up and down Main Street every day in Port Washington and there's 12 businesses within a two, two uh, minute walk from the train station that are closed. That's not good government, that's not sound economic policy. I'm not a policy wonk, I'm not an economics major, I'm a guy who, who has tried to run my business, I've paid exorbitant taxes, I've paid my property taxes on time. Everything that we've done, my wife and I, since I've come to New York and made my home here, has shown me that we're not running things properly in Albany. Look, I, when I graduated from West Point, I, my degree is in basically in environmental engineering. I appreciate Michelle's opposition to using chemicals in microfrac and the, um, sorry, the uh, hydrofracking, but there are other options that we need to consider. We do need to look at the engineering, not propaganda, but engineering. And we need to consider the, the real hard math, both in the economy and in the environment, that to protect the resources we have. With regard to the hydrofracking, real quick, the stuff's been there for 30,000 plus years. It's not going anywhere while we get this stuff figured out. Anyway, my name's Rick Steek. I'm just a guy trying to get elected so we can get the government under control. Thank you very much. Does this work? We can share. Okay, we can share. I want to ask a question about the 2% tax capitalism.